Hi everyone, welcome back to another Common Tennis video. Today what I wanted to share with you is I actually did an Instagram live video where I talked with Milan Klipina from Unrivaled Athletics. We talked a lot about how to stay fit during the quarantine and lockdowns. We also talked a lot about just fitness in general and training, especially in terms of tennis players. So a little bit about Milan and his work with Unrivaled Athletics. He is a certified personal trainer. He's trained with both youth teams as well as adult teams. He has also done one-on-one -on -one training with all kinds of athletes at all different levels, all the way from amateur to pro athletes. He definitely knows what he's talking about. So I was very happy to have a conversation with him and get his opinion on a lot of these topics. Just to make it a little bit easier for you guys to navigate the video because we did cover a lot of topics. I left the timestamps of the titles of the topics we discussed down in the comment section as well as in the description of this video so that you guys can go through and navigate and pick the topics that you wanted to listen to or you can just listen to the whole video if you find it interesting. All right guys, thank you and enjoy. Just trying to keep busy. I've got, I've had to convert everything to, to online now. So it's just yeah. online programming and then FaceTime one-on-ones. Uh, -on yeah, that's what I was gonna ask you about. Like how, how has that been like transitioning from working with like clients in a gym to then having to train them from a screen? Uh, the first couple were rough. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, just because when you're when you're in person with someone, mm -hmm. um, sign my forehead. Who's that? Isaiah. Um, <laughs> but we don't want another hour of screen time. Yeah, yeah. Right? So it's just easier for them to like do it on their own time. Um, and then if they need me, they just send me videos of it. Yeah, I guess yeah, that works pretty well. Like what has done it's open yeah, like for for me like working with like the tennis players like getting to record their stuff has been like one of the biggest I guess improvements to my coaching you know like especially with like working with like different shots like the serve for example like yeah. having them like record it and then watching their own mistakes back has been like a very useful tool for me to like help people get better so yeah um, like it could be something useful for for you as well in terms of like training them yeah like, in person uh, record especially speed training um, I record almost every rep that I can or time it yeah. just to give them some kind of feedback. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but the mom called, um, just so that they can see, cause most athletes that I work with are visual, like they're yeah. really, really visual. So as soon as they see it, they know what I'm talking about. But if I just like sit there and talk, they'll be like, Oh yeah, I get what you mean. Mm -hmm. But they actually have no clue, but they just don't want to seem that way yeah i hear you but like i mean i like what you talked about like in terms of like the screen time and like people being on their couch all the time yeah um one thing like i noticed in myself is like obviously i'm not as active as i was before in terms of like you know actually like having to walk around at work you know like pretty much my whole job i can do from the couch right now right so what i find is that my hips have been getting pretty tight so yeah, of course, the, the sitting curse, you know, so yeah. uh, I had to like, I find that throughout the day, I have to do a lot of like hip releases to just maintain like a good, you know, all around mobility. Yeah, so one of my coaches back in the day, uh, when I was at York, his whole thing was for every what is it, an hour or two hours of sitting, you mm -hmm. should be two minutes of a, of a hip stretch. Right. Just to like compensate it. Yeah, you see that last post there? These kids still remember. <laughs> oh, those jokes. Yeah, I, I hear you, I hear you. Um, but, like, I mean, the kids, like, that I was seeing, like, in terms of the, the people I was coaching as well as, like, the kids from my school, seeing them in gym class and stuff like that, I noticed that, like, that is one of the biggest problems is that, like, the hip mobility is very yeah. limited. And this is, I'm sure, not, not helping the situation. But uh, I got a couple questions that I, I set up for you here, and cool. I'll just get you get you to freestyle your answers and see what comes out. Um, all right, so this is this one's kind of like going off of what I was saying earlier in terms of like positives and negatives. <clears throat> so one of them was for the people that you're training. What are like some positives that you can take from the situation? Like if I'm like an athlete and I I'm stuck at home now. Mm -hmm. How can I turn that from like a negative of missing my sport and not being able to train in the gym and then flip that around into a positive situation? So 
it's made me as a coach get a lot more creative. Um, mm-hmm. And it's made the athletes I'm working with get creative with what they have. So just for an example, most guys don't have weights at home. No, like nothing, no dumbbells, no barbells, like absolutely nothing. So first thing I did with a lot of them was grab a backpack, fill it with books every week to progress the low, just like we would with weights, put a new book in. Right. Right. So you're still getting that same effect of progressive overload, which is what we're looking for in the training program. Mm -hmm. It's, is it absolute science? No, but if I went from lifting five books to six books, I got better. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, one thing I was kind of like telling people in terms of like the tennis and things like that, like to look at it from like a positive lens in terms of training. Like when, when as like an athlete, would you ever get this much time to yeah. like focus on, on your like mistakes, you know, and be able to start correcting? Um, like for me, I knew that like my mobility was something that I needed to work on. But of course, like when you're out there working full time and you're training and you're like competing, yep. when are you going to have time to like tackle these things? Right. So I'm trying to look at it through like the positive way of, you know, if, if I have all this time on my hands, like there's no excuse for me not to be able to address the things that previously yep. I was saying, this is, I don't have time for this, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. So, yeah. Well, I don't know. Have you added anything into like your, your own like routines and trainings? I've gone back to the basics, um, yeah. like bare bones basics of let's get my body to move with just its body. Yeah. Right? And that's something that as a football player, when I was thrown into strength and conditioning, we didn't like, that wasn't a thing, right? Like yeah. they throw a barbell at us from day one, which you know, I have my opinions on that, but they still did a good job. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, the kids I work with, their whole program is body weight for the most part. Right. Like I'll throw in like a med ball or a light weight for them just to like give them something because yeah. a lot of them better with a little, like a very light load in front of them. Yeah. Um, but it's it given me the excuse to go back to the basics and really mm-hmm. perfect body weight exercises. Yeah, definitely. And I would even say like in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of people are maybe getting into fitness now and starting to work out from home just because, like I said, they have a little bit more time on their hands. And I I don't know, sometimes they, when you picture like, okay, fitness and working out, like you immediately think of like going to the gym, lifting weights, getting the plates on the bar, but like mastering, like you said, those like body weight movements is like the best place to start because you get get the control of your own body to be able to then move on to overloading with more more weights and and, you know building from there but uh yeah i mean i guess sometimes you can say there's like like a a connotation around like body weight like it's not going to be enough but like it it has its time and place yeah like earlier on let's build the foundation of relative body strength so Mm -hmm. that's how strong you are with your body weight Right. right If you look at like elite gymnasts, all they do is body weight. Right. And they're some of the strongest people out there. Right. And but they're also like factoring in like gravity to like change yeah. the load on, on each yep. muscle, right? So Exactly. Yeah, I mean like if you're creative then there's of course tons of tons of ways you can build that. Yeah. I actually just uh uploaded on, on my YouTube channel like uh, a body weight workout for, for tennis players. Yeah. So it was like a little bit of squats and uh, getting like the tennis racket involved in while just, you know, trying to be creative, something fun, and, you know, because most people don't have equipment at home. So, yeah, and that's that's been the biggest challenge, especially earlier on when I was trying to write out programs for everybody was yeah. what do you have available? And like, how do I get the same style of training that you get when you're with me one on one now on your own with nothing? Mm hmm. Right. And now it's just, it's get everybody to get really good at the basics, which is, you know, your body weight squats, lunges, pull ups. If you have a pull up bar, um, if not, get creative, put a broomstick across two chairs. Right. 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 Use, use the things that are, that are available. Right? Yeah. Like don't, don't sit there and pout about the things you don't have. Go and mm-hmm. do what you can. Right. Mm-hmm. So that also brings me to the next question, which is, in terms of like people getting equipment 
and like having home equipment, what right. would you recommend? So personally, I've been working a lot with kettlebells okay. just because one, they don't take up a lot of space. They're very versatile in terms of the workouts you can do. And I find that like you can really engage like the, the smaller muscles within your body in terms of like stabilizing yep. and keeping the balance. Um, and I would add, I guess like resistance bands to an at home yeah. kind of equipment list. What, what do you like what mine, do you have in your bag? My number one for home training, um, uh, is a resistance band, like different kinds, um, uh, for whoever oh, we got a we got a question there where do you recommend buying resistance bands uh you want to tackle this one because you have a little bit more knowledge in terms of the brands and different places you can elite fts is probably the best on the market um my bands are from northern lights i believe um just because i happen to have gotten a discount with them when yeah. i was working for check um but elite fts is probably the best ones on the market i just don't know who still has them in stock because that's yeah the so, right now is everything's out of stock i i bought mine on amazon a while yeah. ago that's an easy one but uh, what i found was that like these were like the smaller ones that you kind of go around your knees yeah but i couldn't find any good like packages in terms of the longer resistance bands so i don't know if yeah those don't usually come in packages it's they just sell them as singles individually yeah, yeah. like that's the biggest thing so that would be like my number one thing to have different resistance bands in general so your light resistance medium and heavy mm -hmm. um, and the mini bands that you're talking about the ones that go around your uh your knees yeah for like monster walk stuff like that again medium light um and heavy if you can yeah then and i find like, in terms of, like budget you can't really beat getting resistance bands no, like no because there's, so there's cheap. thousands of exercise yeah. to do with them right and i mean like in terms of i mean for the price of the equipment yeah like I don't think you're going to find any like fitness equipment that's going to be cheaper than resistance bands if you're looking for something to have at home. No, not at all. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the number one thing. Like it, it makes every exercise a little bit harder and it changes, um, how the muscle is being used. Right. Right. And, uh, have, do you have uh, kettlebells at home too? I don't, I have like back in when I was in high school, my dad ended up getting me like a 50 pound weight set. Yeah. Like, I still have that from 10. So you're using uh, that? So I'm using those. Uh, it only goes up to 50 pounds, so I still have to strap bands around my neck and my feet. Yeah. And make it a little bit harder, but tempo is the biggest thing I've changed. Okay, so, so how did you adjust if that? You take a squat, for example. Yeah. I'm doing, like, five to eight seconds on the way down, and then I might pause for five, you know, two to five seconds, whatever it is, and then mm -hmm. it blow back up or even add the tempo to that. All right, so for somebody who is not an expert like me and probably most of the people that are going to watch this, because it's it cool if I post this on YouTube too? Yeah, that, absolutely. All right, cool. So yeah. for most of the people that are going to watch, what is the like benefit of changing the tempo? Like in terms of what you're doing, like slowing it down, mm -hmm. what kind of like effects will that have in terms of athletic performance? Uh, so when you, look at, when you look at any kind of athletic movement, there's three phases to it. So there's your eccentric, which is the lowering portion, mm -hmm. or your force absorption portion, right? So when I go to cut, for example, I need to absorb all that, that weight that's coming down, mm -hmm. then stop it, which is your isometric or your amortization, if you want to get fancy with it. And then there's your concentric, <laughs> right? And then there's, then there's your concentric action, which is the explosion part, right? Or right. The, the contraction part mm -hmm. right so training those aspects of it is gonna carry over to when you actually need to fire those muscles mm -hmm. okay so in terms of like tennis we're gonna take a look at tennis as the sport that we're gonna look at so it's a lot of explosive movements yeah right a lot of quick movements quick stops yeah so if I am now gonna transfer that to my workout what kind of pacing am I looking for as a tennis player? So the way that I, I go about it with my more advanced guys is I'll have one phase. This is all taken from triphasic training. Anyone that wants to kind of dive more into it. Um, triphasic training is a book by Cal Dietz and Ben Peter. Um, I take, I've taken his concept and I, that's, that's what I use for my more elite guys is I'll spend one month on just eccentric so heavy like 
80%, 85% of your one rep max. And I'm going to lower that. So let's just take the squat, for example. I'm going to lower that mo motion for five seconds down and mm -hmm. then explode up. Or mm -hmm. it's help me up, which, whichever one you have access to. Then we're going to do one month of metrics where I'm coming down and I'm stopping myself. Dead stop, pause, and then explode out. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to go into our concentric, which is what everybody knows. They go down and you go up. Right. And right? I think, I guess a lot of people don't even consider the other ones. Like, I feel like that's the one that you're going to see the most. Everybody you know? just Walk does concentric, concentric, concentric. Um, right. But then the isometrics and the eccentrics, what I like, what it does for the tendons and the ligaments. Mm. Right. So your eccentrics are going to obviously break down the most amount of, um, it's going to cause the most amount of tissue damage. The isometrics, what I've been reading about is it's actually good for tendons. They respond really well to isometrics. Yeah. Um, which is something that strength coaches always look for, like tendon stiffness, mm -hmm. which will carry so, like the, the, I guess the strength in your tendons, how is that like affecting your, your performance and power generation? So when you're, when you're looking at just sprinting, for example, yeah, running on tendons doesn't, doesn't really use much energy. I like using the tendons elasticity, mm -hmm. that's get that pop. Okay, so it's more like a like a spring kind of action to be able to move move it a little bit quicker. Gotcha. Right, so you always want to have those stiff, ready, and healthy, right? Mm -hmm. That it'll carry over to what we're doing uh, with our jumps and our sprints. Mm -hmm. Which and I like, like a lot of, uh, I guess, doing these kinds of movements would also help with injury prevention because yep. a lot of them do come from, like, tendon damage. Yep. And uh, like, I mean, in tennis, running side to side with those quick stops, especially around the ankle or knees, yeah. then getting that strength in is, is definitely going to benefit people in terms of their longevity, being able to stay healthy and perform well, right? So, yeah. And yeah. like, if you look at like the rehab setting, that's, that's what they're doing all the time. Like when, when I, to, I, I've been hurt so much that <laughs> I've, I've been in physio enough that they're always looking at eccentric isometrics to get you yeah. back into playing right right um i feel you man with the shoulder like it took me so long to recover from that and be able to you know perform well again so i, I definitely feel you in terms of being able to strengthen and that's what you know it takes it's i hate to say it but like sometimes it takes like an injury for you to realize how important it is to, to train and be able to maintain everything because uh you know you as long as you're like me i was just playing and nothing was going wrong. So I just continued on and eventually like all the little wear and tear catches up. Right. So get older and then <laughs> <it starts. laughs> yeah, man, I, I don't say it yet. Once we pass 30, then, then we'll, we'll start saying that. Uh, all right. Let me see what else I got for you here. Um, all right. So, okay. This is, this is an interesting one because this is thinking more about like the general sports world. So once this is all over, how do you think like athletes are going to be returning to their sports? Like in terms of like high level NHL, NBA, do you think that we're going to see people like returning with like levels of physical performance that are going to be higher maybe than what we've seen because it's pretty much like a super long off season where they, where they're training or you can see a dip in performance. We're going to see a rise in injuries. Mm, okay. Why do you say that? If you look at, so I just I actually just heard this on um, PGF Performance. So go, guys, go check him out because he's he's a genius. Uh, but he was talking about the NBA and guys coming back from doing these basically body weight training. Um, and basically, and this is my thought too, is you got guys doing body weight training for the most part. They got no equipment. So yeah, you're getting the muscles, tendons, ligaments ready for your sport. On top of that, most of them aren't playing their sport now, mm -hmm. right? So, you, the best way to prep for your sport is to play your sport. Right. Right. Me in the weight room gives you more of a capacity to play your sport at a higher level, but at the end of the day, you still need to be playing your sport to get better. Does that make sense? I was been listening on the radio, like they were talking about the NHL potentially coming back sooner. Like uh, I think they were talking around June then going directly into a playoff situation. Yeah. So, I mean, like what you're saying, like in terms of, you know, you need to have, you need to be playing the sport to be 
able to prevent those injuries. And then if you're throwing athletes like that into a playoff situation right away, where they're expected yeah. to go like 110%, then it's like a recipe for disaster, right? So many injuries. Like even the the NFL lockout, again, I heard this from the PGF performance. Um, mm-hmm. They were, they she showed me the stats and like injury rate just shot up. They had so much more right. time to team, but injury rate shot up just because their bodies are not prepared for their sport. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. End season, you come into playoffs, especially where like shit just happens in playoffs. Yeah. Right. Um, their bodies just aren't prepped to play at that kind of level. Um, you're gonna need like a month, a month like training camp to get really ready. Mm-hmm. Like a training, playing the sport. Yeah, like like a like a month long of just practice before I think that guys would be ready to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting take for sure. Like personally, I'm trying to like my mindset is to try to come out. You know, I heard this before, but like you want to come out stronger. Yeah, than you went in right, but you, know, you, said that you need to be playing the sport as well. Yeah, you want to have the strongest base possible right now. Like that's what guys should should uh, prepare for. Is come mm-hmm. with the the biggest foundation they possibly can, because realistically, yeah, you can get a little bit stronger, you can get a little bit faster, and a little bit more power. But they'll get work done. I'm not saying you can't. No. But the capacity of those guys of like not having their sport, all they're doing is training with like mm-hmm. full equipment. A lot of them, like 20 mm-hmm. pounds at most. Most of them can squat. Like I've, I've, I've guys that can like deadlift 400 pounds, and all they have access to is a 20 pound dumbbell. Right. Right. So you take that, and then on top of that, not having the abuse of what their sport usually has. Mm-hmm. I personally think there's gonna be a lot more injuries. That's been like a pretty hot topic in terms of like people commenting on tennis because, like you're saying, like it depends on like what you have access to, right? And so. Yep. They're saying that like there's all these top players who are wealthy because of like where they've reached in the sport, who have yeah. access to tennis courts at their houses, right? Right. They've got their trainers there that live with them, so they're able to continue practicing their sport. They have full weight rooms available to them, whereas right. people like trying to break through don't have those things available. So it's just going to create like a larger gap in yeah. sports like that. Um, yeah, I can definitely see that. I can definitely see that. The ones that are trying to break through right now are the ones that are at the highest risk of injury, I think. Right. Right, because you know they have they have nothing. They got that twenty pound dumbbell that we're talking about, um, and they're probably training. They're probably doing their like sport activities, like just the like for tennis in particular. It's so much repetition of mm-hmm. the shoulder. Right. Now you're not strengthening the backside. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean even even at like a more micro level, like even for me, like I can see it's been like well over, I'd say probably a month and a half since I've been on the court to play. And like my calluses, I can see on my hand are going. So like, I already know going into it, like I'm gonna have to suffer through the blisters like right away. And it's just like, yeah, I don't know. I I wanna look forward to it, but then I know that there's gonna be like the pain that's gonna be coming as well, just trying to get into it. So I'm already like planning about like how to pace myself in terms of coming back and like that's the other thing too is people are going to be coming back like as soon as these lockdowns are lifted they're going to be so excited to be playing the sports and that's another like a risk for injury too right? people are going to go play basketball play tennis they're going to be out there for hours probably just excited to be back on the court and yeah the body's going to suffer i did all that stuff gonna come. all right so we talked a little bit about working out at home we talked about equipment i also wanted to touch on recovery with you because this is like the ultimate recovery time. So I wanted to see from, from you, what do you think is like good strategies and good habits in terms of recovery? I know that you're a big fan of foam rolling. You, I had to buy a foam roll after a training with you, a foam roller, and that's been a big help. I was wondering if there's like any other tips that you have in terms of recovery and maybe even how to space recovery through your workouts. Like for me, my schedule right now is I do two days of working out and I do a recovery day, but even my recovery day is like an active recovery where I'll do like a yoga or just walking around doing something slightly active, but you know, not getting the heart rate too elevated, not really lifting any weights, things like that. So I was wanted to hear your opinion on terms of 
maximizing your recovery. Well, I definitely taught you well. Uh, that's actually <laughs> I, how I'm, I'm trying, man. I'm improving. <laughs> I, I know that you, I don't know if you've read this one. Let me. I, I've been reading. Let me turn it around for you. Yeah, I. I a supple leopard. It's pretty good. So I've been learning a little bit from there too, watching the YouTube videos, doing as much reading as I can. So I mean, yeah, it's, it's all it's all helping. Yeah. So in terms of recovery, your number one thing is going to be sleep. Um, we all know like you need to get a minimum of eight hours. Um, the youth athletes, I do recommend 10 if you can get it. So like high school, mm -hmm. even early college and younger, try to get 10. Um, but sleep, like get into a sleep schedule. This is the perfect development. Oh, see, like that is not a problem for me. I know for a lot of the kids that I teach that is like a huge problem, but I swear, man, I'm like clockwork, but I kind of put in like a protocol for myself. Like I know, an hour before I'm gonna go to bed, I turn off the screens. It's time to like grab a, and that that helps me. Am I back there? Sorry, I cut out for a second, but grab a book and that's gonna, you know, kind of cut out that screen time, separate your day, so that you're not still stuck on thinking the last thing you were thinking about before bed. Because I find that that's how people end up losing sleep, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, definitely sleep. I can see is a big factor. But how about when you're when you're awake? What what can we do to to maximize recovery? A good warm up obviously is gonna just make sure that you stay healthy during the warm or during the workouts. Then from there, so the way I like to split up my day, which is very similar to, to what you're doing, is I'll have a day on, which is like a hard day for me. Um, then mm -hmm. I'll do a recovery day or like a lighter day. Um, then I have that Wednesday, which is gonna be a harder day again. Then my Thursday is gonna be uh, a lighter day again or active recovery. I, it depends on my body's feeling right intuitive with with how i'm feeling so if i need just like straight mobility work mm -hmm. i'll do the day of mobility and i feel like that's something that i'm still not as good at i find that like i get very hard on myself if i'm not sticking to my schedule mm -hmm. and there are days i know when i'm probably a little bit too sore to be doing another workout but it, i don't know it's hard for me to kind of justify another recovery day but i don't know how, how do you kind of gauge when time to kind of suck it up and carry on with a workout and when you should maybe take a break so if we're talking like in the gym setting i i base it off of my vertical jump so like i'll measure that three times a week mm -hmm. and if it deviates by you know five percent then i'll shut myself down for the day i see already that's like a gem of knowledge because I didn't even think of like measuring anything, you know, like I always like went off of like a feeling, but yeah. that is like a perfect tip right there. Uh, find something measurable, right? So, yeah. So, so yeah. measuring something's the easiest way to do it. Um, Cause it's very easy to just be like, ah, I don't feel it today. Mm -hmm. it happened to me. Like I've walked in the gym, I'm like, damn, I don't feel it. And then I hit a, a vertical jump PR mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I'm like, Oh shit. Like let, let's go. Right. Right. Um, and it's not an exact science either. Like there's still days where like you hit a good number and then the rest of the workout, you can't get the numbers you want. Right. 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 But, and uh, then how about, how about like in terms of motivation, like say you're feeling like one of those days where it's kind of like a bit of a drag, just getting yourself to the point of working out. Do you have like any kind of things that you kind of go through, maybe like a ritual or a, or a mantra that you say to yourself to get yourself like in in the zone to, to get get your stuff done. So I, I try to turn my phone off, um, and sometimes it's hard to do so just because I'm the only person running Unrivaled Athletics, so I do have to still respond to other people and make sure clients are set up for the day or the week. Right. Uh, but during my own workouts, especially now, I try to just turn my phone off, get it out of my face, um, mm -hmm. just so that I can focus on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Right? Because that, that I do find is... Yeah. Yeah, I'm in a mood where I'm like, you know what? I don't want to work out, and mm -hmm. I have my phone in front of me. I'm on Instagram, just scrolling. Just I know, man. I I definitely feel you with that. Like, I mean, as soon, like I know when I post like something new, especially like on YouTube and stuff like that, I I'm like always so tempted to just check back, like refresh, see if people yeah. come. You know, you want to engage and you want to share like the things that you know with people. So, I, I feel you, and it's kind of hard to turn off sometimes, turn the phones off, and and kind of be present with it. But um. I find that one thing that helped me a lot in terms of kind of maintaining that energy level, because what I found before was there was oftentimes when 
uh, I usually like put my workouts towards the end of the day. And okay. I, like by the time I got there, I was very tired and like it was very hard for me to just get into the mindset of having to like get a workout done, you know? So I switched the times around to work better for me and that's another kind of positive that I've been able to pull out of this whole situation is that now I'm able to kind of tweak my schedule a little bit more and since I'm at home, like right. even a break for me where I would normally be sitting in like a staff room, so right. again, I can use that as a productive time to get things done. So. What I've done is I've scheduled, I've kind of monitored myself over some time to see where my energy is peaking and where it's dipping. Right, right, and I'm right. To use, that, use those points where it's low to recover. So I'll use that as like my dinner, my rest. I, I won't really plan anything active around those times. So that's usually after like six o'clock. Right. And then earlier in the day when I have lots of energy is when I do my activities. So I've kind of scheduled it as like my, uh, right after lunch, I'll do like a yoga and I've been trying to do a yoga every day. Nice. Uh, just to kind of keep that mobility, like I said, since I'm sitting so much. And, and then around 3 o'clock, when I notice that I have a lot of energy, is when I schedule my workouts now. So that was normally would be 45 minutes in traffic, just commuting. So this has been an opportunity for me to kind of sh- switch my schedule around and, yeah. and it work better towards how I feel. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to do it. You know, I personally train in the morning or like earliest afternoon just because that's usually a downtime when I'm at the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just kept that because I, I do really well on that, like training around either at like 9 a.m., 7 a.m. around there or that like 12 to 1. Yeah. yeah. Other thing too is like I think mentally that helps as well because if you have that workout that you're going to plan to do at 8 p.m., then in the back of your head, whatever you're doing, you're always like, oh, I got to like work out tonight, you know? Yeah. And, and besides that, I'm also trying to like change the mindset to – like, you know, you always try to find, find a positive way. Of course, it's going to hurt. Like, if you're doing a good workout, you're going to be tough. It's going to be a struggle. But I'm looking at it more as, like, a challenge for myself. You know, yeah. like, this is something that I'm doing for me to, to benefit my, my body and my health, you know? So yeah, that's course. one way to, I guess, I try to keep myself motivated to, to get training done. The yoga in every day. So that's right. been something helpful. All right, buddy. I won't hold you any longer. I think that's... Uh, we got a pretty good amount of info for everybody watching and uh, hopefully, you know, people are going to take a look at this on YouTube as well, learn a little bit more in terms awesome. of their training and, and get the most out of out of their time at home. I appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Uh, no problem. Do you want to maybe tell people about what you do at Unrivaled Athletics and maybe yeah, people so- can reach you if they have more questions? So Unrivaled Athletics is a sports performance company found in, um, in Toronto. Um, we deal with the youth athletes from eight years old all the way to professional athletes of whatever age they're at. Um, well, you can find me. Most of my clients come through the Instagram account here at, at unrivaled underscore athletics. Uh, we have a website, train Um, and then that those are the best two ways to, to get in contact with me. All right. All right. Thank all right. you. Have a great night, buddy. You too.